uh, a DDoS attack. I think it's one terabit per second. If we take the bisection of the internet, I think it's around 200. One of our data centers typically operates at about 1,300 uh, terabit per second. That's uh, the throughput. So yeah, you can, when, when, we have, when we're confronted by things like DDoS, take that one and compare it to our 1,300. You can kind of see what we have to cope with and what we can offer our customers as well. So we're going to move on to Google Cloud Platform. Um, <coughs> A little history, or at least our philosophy in cloud. So if you think about how cloud has evolved over the years, I mean, first of all, companies had their data centers in their basements. And I actually spoke to a big enterprise company recently, and I was telling them this story, and he, he put his hand up in admission and said, we still have a data center in a basement. Uh, and this was a big, big company. And he said, and actually it was in London, and he said the, the Thames rose uh, a little bit high, and they managed to escape by half a foot of water. So that was a bit of a shocker for them. Um, we already know about the, the, the positive um, uh, advantages of co-location. So, you know, kind of benefit from infrastructure, uh, a different location along with other people. But co-locations as well, they, they're kind of confounded pretty much like your brain by the size of your skull. So as big as that building can be, it's as much as we can cram into it. So if we move on a little bit, we have the public cloud offering, which is basically kind of virtualizing your data center. Um, but for us, cloud is much more than that. We believe that cloud isn't just about computing in a different place. It's about going further than that. It's about computing differently. So if we take the things that we're good at, infrastructure, security, speed, um, data processing, data science, and actually make that into automatic services which are intelligent. That's the way we believe as a company we can actually help people. So that's our philosophy in cloud. That does not mean that we don't have VMs and, and, and the rest of the offerings as well. We do, absolutely. And I, I, I advise you to go and have a look at them if they're, of, if they're of interest. But it's really about where computing's going. And cloud is very much behind that story for us. So this is a very, very um, scant view of what Google Cloud has to offer. And we're going to focus today on the data analytics and machine learning. If I put all the different offerings that we have on here, you wouldn't be able to look at the slide anymore. But So I've just reduced it to a few important things. Um, and we're going to be talking about data flow, and we're going to be talking about cloud machine learning in a little bit. So without further ado, machine learning. Um, what can I say? I mean, machine learning's been around for a long time. Um, researchers, data scientists have been working on machine learning problems for years. I mean, it goes back to the 60s. A lot of what we understand and know is based on that work. But it's only really been the last years that we've actually seen a real movement in machine learning. And there's a reason for that. Because if you're going to have good machine learning, there are a few ingredients which you need. You need large data sets, so you need a lot of data to train your model. If you train it on a small amount of data, you're going to overfit. You're going to have very specific models, which aren't going to generalize very well. So we need good models. Uh, that kind of take advantage of that data as well. So we've, we've built up an understanding over the years about what makes a good model. But what we also need is lots of computational power. If you think about having good models that are very complicated, uh, complicated having thousands and thousands of nodes interconnected, and if you think about trying to put large amounts of data through that as well, if you don't have a large computing system behind you, you're really not going to be able to get through that workload. So what does this mean? Well, this is our view. Uh, machine learning is made for cloud, um, because we can bring all of those ingredients together. So this is a neural network, a very simple one. Um, when I looked at this, first of all, I actually thought it was a cat, but I've been told it's a dog. Uh, <laughs> so what we're trying to do in a, in a deep neural network is basically activate layers of neurons to identify something. This is a classification problem. And in classification problems, we're always going to have like uh, an output which corresponds to the classes at the top. So in this particular very naive example, we're trying to identify if something is a cat or a dog. And so at the end, we will have two outputs, one which will say, I'm a dog, and the other one which will say, I'm a cat. And the layers in between are basically trying to take the features of that image and look at elements of it. And we will apply something we will call weights, and we'll look at that in a moment, to actually say, well, these, these features are important in recognizing that this is a dog or this is a cat. So we have a way of actually giving uh, weight to those weights. Uh, it's actually called um, <coughs> backward propagation. Uh, and, and that allows us to adjust those weights to actually kind of highlight the things that are important while we're trying to recognize what something is and actually classify it. So this is a very, very kind of short and naive look. 
Um, there are two ways which we can help with this. So we have, if we go back to what I just said about we want to give, um, we want to make things clever, we want to auto automate things, we want to make things intelligent. We believe there are two ways of doing that. One is to bring your own model. And we're going to talk about TensorFlow uh, in a bit. So uh, we'll come back to that. The other one is trained machine learning models. So for example, if we take a problem like OCR, I, we've trained OCR with using a lot of data. Um, so this model is very useful. So we want to offer this model in the easiest possible way to other people. So that you can make your inference on a document, on an image, and actually get the text out. Other things that we do, and, and I will be demoing one of these in a little while. I'll leave it up to you to anticipate which one it is. But some of the other things that we do is um, speech to text. Um, so we will take actual uh, people speaking, and we will actually tr try, uh, t take that and turn it into text. We can do that in real time, and we can also do that in batch as well. So again, it's a very useful thing to be able to offer. Um, and we train that on something like 80 different languages at the moment. Translation, here's a really nice story about translation. Um, our translation used to be rule-based, and we're gradually moving all the models to a, a deeper neural network. Um, <coughs> Japanese uh, was one of the languages that we, we took first, and we actually, uh, I think the, it, it goes something like the, the, the progress we'd made in 10 years on applying rules to make trans good translations, we managed to kind of equal that in the time that we spent doing a deep neural network. And um, there was a professor, and you, you can search on the internet for this one, that actually took some uh, works of, uh, I'm going to forget who it was now, but some English literary works, and I really should know. Uh, he took the works, and he actually translated it to Japanese, and then translated it back again, and he gave it to his students to say, try and find out which one is my translation, and which one is the machine's. And they struggled. The professor was able to identify it because there were a few articles and things missing, but that's how far it's coming along. So, it looks quite easy. Um, if, I, if I was to ask you to, to create something to identify either a dog or a mop, I mean, this looks quite naive, and you think, well, I could probably, you know, with, a, with something quite simple, come up with something that handles this. But what if we up the ante a little bit? So I think this is just great. <laughs> I mean, I, I, when I looked at this one, I was really struggling. So, <laughs> is this a mop or is it a dog? I mean, I think it's a, it's a great game you can play on, a, on an evening with your friends as well. So we'll, we'll look at this a little bit later about how we approach these problems. Um, I'm going to ask James to join me on the, on the stage now. And he's going to, well, the, the demo I told you about one of our APIs. So this is our video API. It's recently launched. Um, what you're going to see here, and you can try this on the website yourself. You can go up there and you can upload one of your videos. And basically, it will take your video and it will start processing it. And in a moment, you will see the, 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 the labels, the shot labels that we find in that video. So that's quite, that's quite a nice thing to be able to do, no? I mean, that you can take a video and go through it shot by shot, and we can actually label what's happening in that video. I think you can probably already imagine some of the use cases for media companies, for example, what they could do with this. Um, can you flick back to the slides for a second? Thanks. So what's going on there? Um, well, this is basically make an API request, send your video, and you'll get this information back. You'll get these labels back, and it will tell you with what confidence we saw it. And importantly, we'll see here the start time of the offset and the end time of the offset. So we will look how we can make that a bit more useful now. So in this demo, we're taking a few of our, our, of our managed cloud services. Everything here is, is basically managed. Um, App Engine at the top, is, we launched it like six years ago. It's our platform as a service. Um, you only have to concern yourself with the code, uh, none of the infrastructure, load balancing, or caching, or database connections. Um, cloud functions, there's a serverless function. So what's going on? We're going to upload video content to some storage. We're going to use cloud functions to actually realize that those videos are coming and tell us to do something. We're going to take the, vid uh, the video intelligence API and process those videos. And then we're going to take the metadata that we create and put it back into storage for now. And then we're going to access that with an application that we're running on App Engine. So James, if I can ask you to go to our demo, and I'm going to try and get some water and not spill it on the floor. <clears throat> so if you can just go back to the, the, the screen before, uh, uh, the, so the search screen. Uh, this one. 
Great. So basically what we've done here is upload a whole load of videos and we've, uh, it's a cloud storage. We've, we've processed the metadata and we've created a search. This, this, to put this together was a matter of hours. So um, if we search for, what did we agree we were going to search on? Well, um, snow. We're going to try snow again because there were some nice images there. So we can search for snow. And if we can go to one, if we can actually drill down into the video itself, so not actually click here, yeah, if you click on the title, well, and you'll get a dictionary definition, and that's an added bonus that's supplied just by the operating system. <laughs> and you'll see here all the metadata, uh, and one of them would be snow if we do a little search. There we go. And we can see the moments in the video when snow is there. So let's have a look. There we go. And let's skip across maybe to one, uh, the one on the end there. And again, in this video, we're able to take snow. You get the idea. This is pretty awesome stuff. So again, this is really um, taking, uh, <coughs> this is just taking our APIs, gluing them together in a way which is useful. So just being creative with the application. And we've now managed to create a database which we can actually search through video content. So <coughs> coming back to that photo, in case anyone was still obsessed by it, um, we can recognize that this one is a dog. <laughs> so we talked about the APIs. Uh, we're now going to go to the, the, to the deeper stuff when you start developing and bringing your own models and the challenges involved with that. And I've asked people to give me like hands up on time and stuff because I have no idea how long I'm standing here. So <laughs> just to remind them, they're not listening. Um, <coughs> What's the popular conception of uh, machine learning? So machine learning for lots of people uh, is lots of data, some kind of magic, complicated mathematics, and some wonderful result. This is not the reality of machine learning. The reality of machine learning is much closer to this. It's doing a lot of hard work to collect the data. It's doing a lot of hard work to organize that data and make it useful, cleanse the data, extract um, features, for example. Then we can talk about creating the model, training that model, and then actually finding a place where we can use that model. So we're going to look at a, a, a useful and common design pattern. Let me start from the beginning. <clears throat> We've got a whole bunch of data. We want to do some pre-processing, feature creation, train the model, deploy that model somewhere, and then from this side, we want the clients to be able to make a request and get a prediction. If you think about some of the challenges at the top, they kind of mirror the challenges at the bottom, no? We have to deploy our model up there to train it. We have to be able to access this model in production. Um, the work that we did to pre-process and extract features from our data when we were about to train our model can be very similar to the, the, the activities that we need to do when we, before we make a prediction. So we probably need to, from that request that we get from the customer, we probably need to extract the similar features. So wouldn't it be great if we can have kind of like approach this in a, in a unified way? So we'll look first of all how we collect data and organize it. <clears throat> so here's a little, bit, a little bit more about our philosophy at, at Google. Uh, our cloud should be an open cloud. We're very strong supporters of open source. Uh, Kubernetes, I'm sure, that most people already uh, heard of and played around with. Uh, for data processing, uh, we created a, a, a model, an SDK, called um, Beam. It's, Beam is the open source project, and Dataflow is the managed API in which you can run this, this, this um, SDK at Google on our servers without having to concern yourself with all the servers that you need and the scaling and all the rest of it. So a little walkthrough history. I'm going to do this quickly. But MapReduce, this was a paper by Google back in 2004. We would look at why did we, why did we write a paper on MapReduce? Well, as I said, we collect a lot of data. And we needed to, so, so for example, we take logs. We needed to process those logs to understand what um, users were doing, what, how we could improve services, and all this kind of thing. So there was a lot of data there. And a kind of standard database solutions weren't good enough. This paper. Um, obviously, there are more papers involved, but this paper had a very big influence on what happened in the Hadoop uh, community. So you start seeing things like Hadoop, uh, MapReduce, HBase, 
And all of these, you can find your kind of corresponding Google paper. We, as I said, we're a research company as well. So we have a lot of researchers working on this. But we didn't just research them. We actually built these systems as well. These systems are actually underneath uh, how Google works for applications like YouTube and our search applications as well. Um, <clears throat> At some point, we realized uh, that there was this correlation between publishing great white, pa white papers, creating the software ourselves, and then seeing a kind of mirror happening in the uh, open source community. So one of the things we did with, with Dremel, for example, that's up here on the right. Dremel, you might know as BigQuery. Dremel's our internal name. BigQuery is the external name, which is on Google Cloud. It's basically our analytical platform. It's our data warehouse. Um, you can run query, I mean, the largest queries run actually involve trillions of rows. It's completely managed. We can stream in, uh, I think the largest streaming is in, in the millions per second as well. Um, we can run queries of petabytes. We have customers that are storing 122 and above petabytes of data on the system. And the reason we created uh, Dremel was because MapReduce wasn't good enough. So MapReduce has a lot of good qualities, but one of them isn't compressing data. So instead of storing all this data in rows, we flipped it and started storing it in columns so we could get better compression on our data. And this allowed us um, to really kind of um, <coughs> explore, um, uh, uh, well, give, use, give uh, analysts the power to run SQL queries, like ANSI-based SQL queries, on huge data sets. If you think about some of the things that you'll need to put together to offer that same capability, it's quite, a, a, quite an achievement. Um, we took it further with the likes of Kubernetes, Beam, and TensorFlow, which are all open source projects. The reason we make these open source projects is because we want to work with the community to actually improve them. So um, TensorFlow, we're seeing at the moment, has more than 480 contributors, and a lot of those don't work for Google. Of course, there are a lot of Google engineers contributing to that project as well. Um, Another thing is we believe in cloud economics. So we want to have uh, um, services which are actually portable, which you can use anywhere. So if you want to run it on your own location, fine, go ahead. You want to run it on our cloud, cloud, good. You want to run it on someone else's cloud, that's also good. That's your choice. We will do our best to give you the best reasons and the best, uh, economically speaking and performance-wise, to run it on us. But we believe that what you run is your workload, it's, it's your, yeah, your intellectual property that you're creating. You should be able to take it anywhere that you want to go. So that's why we put so much effort into our open source uh, uh, efforts. So Apache Beam does that for, um, for data processing. So we'll look a little bit what it is. Um, can I get a raise of hands who's familiar with a Lambda architecture? Who likes, okay, keep your hand up if you like Lambda architecture. Okay, we've got one brave soul there in the front, and someone kind of doubting about um, When Lambda architecture first came out, I was selling it to people as the best thing since sliced bread, because you could do things that you couldn't do before. You could like take batches of data, um, start processing it, and then you could take your streaming data as it came in and kind of update your batch, and then produce results for people. But this streaming uh, data, I've got 20 minutes left? OK, great, thank you. So uh, this streaming data that we came in often wasn't in the right order, or there was some kind of delay or something. Uh, it didn't follow the same uh, programming model as the batch data. So once the streaming data comes in, you probably had to do another batch of data later to actually kind of bring these results back together to make them real again, so they, they were accurate. So there's quite an intensive process to go through to have a good Lambda architecture. With Apache Beam, we have a unified model. So it doesn't really matter if you're streaming or you're doing batch. The code is the same, and you can just switch the connectors that you want to use, whether it's coming as a streaming or a batch um, <coughs> source. And we look, there's some, there's some real challenges to make this work. And we're going to look now uh, in detail what those challenges are. And, and, and basically, for streaming, it's all about the difference between event time and processing time. So <coughs> event time, that's when something happens. Um, Processing time, that's when we actually start doing something with it. So this line here is like the, the ideal place to be. This is where something happens and we do something about it straight away. That means you know, there's zero latency, um, the, the, the internet connections are always working well, people aren't like on flights playing games and then disconnected from the internet and then rejoining later. So this would be the ideal world. If we, if we get there, then we can just do streaming all the way. I mean, it's, it would be great. And we wouldn't have this problem between event time and processing time. But the reality is we do. Um, and we're going to look here. The, these, these numbers, are, it's, it's a fictive example. So some, we've got some users playing a game. And these are the scores they're actually uh, uh, making uh, whilst playing that game. 
Um, and I'm going to speed up just a tad. So three is on the, almost on the ideal line. But nine, this, this is problematic. You know, It happened at 12.01, and we're not going to see it until 12.08. So this was probably someone on their mid-Atlantic flight that was, you know, well, maybe not. Maybe I'm exaggerating a wee bit. Um, so when you're, trying to do, uh, um, <clears throat> when you're trying to handle this kind of data, there are some challenges that you need to consider. And then if you, if you look at these questions, it really makes the data much more understandable, and you can start thinking about how you're going to develop your model and, and how you're going to use it. So first of all, you want to ask yourself what you're trying to calculate. Are you trying to aggregate stuff? Are you going to run a machine learning model, et cetera? Are you trying to do some joining functions to bring data together? Um, where in event time are these processes, uh, are these uh, events calculated? So, what, what we need to think about then is, is there some kind of concept of a user session where the, the events that they carry out actually occur over this period of time that's important to us? Um, when in processing time are they materialized? Is this happening in seconds afterwards or is it happening in days afterwards? Um, so, we need to consider that. And then, what are we going to do about data that either comes in too early or too late? So, I won't spend too much time on the code, but the what here, and basically we're just going to sum integers per key. Simple enough. So if we were to do this in a batch process, we would get a result about 51. And we, do, we can only really process that result once we've collected all the data. That's batch. So let's start windowing this data. If we window it into fixed windows, what you see now for each window, I can have a score. But what you'll notice, is that the, we can, we're only going to actually output the, row, uh, the results, we're only going to emit the results once all the processing of all the windows is finished. So yes, we've got an idea of windows here, but it's not very useful yet. So the next thing that we need to do is actually calculate a watermark. And we see here the green line is a heuristic watermark. So we kind of base this on some logic which, some, based on some understanding of our data, we supply um, in Apache Beam actually watermarks defined for you based on what's happening. But you can also think about customizing it yourself. Um, so you'll see the ideal watermark here, and then our heuristic watermark. And if we were to follow the, the processing of the windows at the watermark, one of the things you'll see there is the, the score that we got at number nine. We've just completely ignored. We've missed it. So in your Lambda architecture, you'd do a batch later, and then you'd pull that back together again. So you'd update the scores to have something accurate. Um, what we're going to use now is we're actually going to uh, start putting some triggers on this, early firings and late firings. We're focused on the late firings now to actually tell what we're going to do. And important here, you have to think about what you're going to do when you receive that data. So we've said here we're going to accumulate in fired panes, which means each of those windows we're going to retain the data, and when something comes in on our trigger later, we'll still have that information, and we will actually uh, aggregate that. So now, what you see is that, on, especially here on the number five, you see that the, we've, the, the window closed, and then we got a late trigger, and then we'll update that. And then you can think later how you're actually going to apply that. You don't have to aggregate the results. You could, it depends on what's coming after your data flow as well. You could say, right, we're going to push the results to our database system, and then we'll send this update later. Or if you're doing some kind of streaming pilot when you actually want to notify users that there's, there's been an update, you could push an update. You can branch off, so you could do both of those things as well. So I hope this gives a kind of idea of how powerful this is. We can look at how data is arriving in a streaming environment. And the code that we generate, the model that we generate, can, can, can deal with batch data, and it can deal with this difficult streaming data with the notion of late arriving data. So this is one of the ways, and if you think how that relates back to the, the slide on data processing, the batch will really help you sort of collect that data and train it. So you have something there, you have a pipeline that you can use to process that data and get it ready to do your machine learning. And if you look at the, how we can actually take that and apply it to streaming as well, we ha now have something that we can use to make this useful when we want to make our predictions online. So we'll look now at the last three, and I'm going to have to have a sip of water because my mouth is drying up. That's going to look good on the cameras, isn't it? So creating a model now, uh, training the model, and deploying the model. So <clears throat> TensorFlow. There are two other components here. Uh, cloud machine learning is our managed API. 
So basically, you can take your TensorFlow trained model, and if you wish, you can then publish it to our clouds, where we can actually use our scale and, and, and vast number of machines to actually train your model. Um, Cloud Data Lab is a, basically a managed Jupyter Notebook environment. And this, anyone that uses Jupyter Notebooks will know they're very powerful. And having a managed environment which connects to all of our, uh, like all the databases that we use, has all the stuff for TensorFlow in there as well. Um, and, and you can actually share in a, in a collaborative way with your colleagues so you can work on these models together at the same time. That's a very nice place to be. TensorFlow, so it was created by the Google Brain team. Um, as I said, 480 contributors. It's the most popular machine learning project on GitHub. 53,000 stars. That's pretty impressive stuff. Um, it came out in 2015, so it hasn't been there that long to acquire this kind of numbers. And impo important, uh, we can take TensorFlow, and it was architected in a way that it could handle any, um, any architecture underneath. So we, we, we made sure from the beginning that it could work on CPUs, it could work on GPUs, it could work on mobile devices, it could work on clusters. And importantly, we can also use our TPUs, which are kind of a, an, a, a custom uh, accelerator which we use for inference, which is an order of magnitude faster for inference than GPUs. If we hadn't have done that, we would basically be in the business of creating even more data centers to do our inference. So a little bit of history. Um, in, well, I won't go into too much, but in 2011, um, Disbelief, that was our internal machine learning framework. And the reason why we kind of took TensorFlow was be, that we wanted to find a way of taking what those researchers were doing and making sure we could take that quickly to production. Uh, and, and taking advantage of all that hardware as well it enables you to do that. So as I said, you can create this model on your laptop, you can train it in the cloud, and you can also deploy it to something like a mobile uh, phone to do for the predictions. Uh, in 2016, uh, we actually beat Go with TensorFlow and using TPUs as well. So we, they got their honorary Dan. This was quite a big thing. This was one of the big challenges uh, in computing to actually um, to, to win the Go tournament. So we, we discussed this a moment ago. Um, TensorFlow is hard. It's also a data flow system of graphs. And we're going to look a little bit at what that means. So if you can, if you can take this diagram in your head, and you, basically what you see here is different nodes. And on each of these nodes, we're going to perform some kind of action, whether it's uh, matrix multiplication, or um, an activation function, ReLU, or doing uh, some kind of loss function, loss function at the end. So basically, we're able to connect a node together and say, these are the actions that we're doing. But it's not just a data flow. It's a data flow graph with tensors. And so, I mean, it's called TensorFlow as well, so why is that important? Well, everyone has a scalar, single number, a vector, matrix, all the way up. A three-level tensor is a cube, basically, but we can have any dimension of tensor that we want. Why is that important? Well, consider this for a moment. Here, we're going to do some image processing, and we actually have three channels of information here, so the red, green, and blue. And we're going to use this, well, we used this one yesterday in a workshop in a convolutional uh, network that we set up. Uh, we did it grayscale yesterday. Um, but to give you an idea, look at that cube there in the middle. That contains information. So if we were looking at an image and we want to identify features, for example, a curve or a texture in a certain area, and we want to relate that to the different channels of color as well. We need a way of keeping that information together. So that's basically what TensorFlow allows us. So having the edges on our graph all support tensors, that enables us to walk through this graph with, and retain that information connected. So another thing, it has state. So you can shut this down. You can update your models. That's important for things like vi uh, var variables to update biases and things like that. And last of all, it's distributed. So we can take, use, make use of different devices to run the different nodes. So this is why we can part of the architecture. So there are many machine learning frameworks out there, but there are not that many that have been built from the bottom up, really considering how it's going to run on different types of architecture, which is a big part of what TensorFlow does. So this is a simple neural network, actually one that we created yesterday. Um, and basically, we took a great, this was used for the Mince, uh, yeah, the Mince challenge, which is basically taking handwritten digits and trying to um, output them in such a way that we can determine if it's a, a zero all the way up to a nine. We use a simple uh, uh, yeah, linear activation function, sigmoid. You basically, you're, you're taking data there, and at the end, you see that it, it shallows out. Um, and what we're trying to do is take this whole 
like vector of pixels and seeing which ones are important to identify a number. So <clears throat> we don't have time now to build a model. That, we did that yesterday. Um, but this was one of the models we built yesterday. And I, it's horrible looking at code on a big screen. But look at the remarks on the right. Because this, with TensorFlow, is basically creating a model. And this model went up to 92% accuracy. And the important things to see here is that um, we define the model. Um, we have a, a placeholders for our labels and our data coming in. We can define uh, success metrics. And the optimizer, which is an important part of actually trying to um, work out the loss, so how good is our model. And we can define that all in Python code. And this is actually the low-level API. In TensorFlow, we have two levels of APIs, roughly speaking. The low-level stuff where people can really kind of define their models. So here we've only got one layer. But you can imagine if you were trying to connect up hundreds of layers how this code might look. But we also have a high-level estimator API. And the high-level estimator API um, basically allows us to kind of uh, take advantage of common models that have been defined and start using them. So without having to do all the plumbing between the layers. So TensorFlow has both that. It's we're gonna, I'm going to ask Matthias to come to the stage now, and we're going to look at a, a small example. I'll talk you through the architecture very quickly, and then we'll flip to the demo. So Datatonic is a partner that works with Google in, uh, in Belgium and, uh, and Holland, uh, and England as well, sorry. Um, and basically, they built an application. And this application uses both our managed APIs and TensorFlow and using the cloud to train the model. So what's going on here? Um, for the, they created an NLP model, and this NLP model is basically trying to look at um, common complaints in buildings, like something's broken, and actually work out what needs to be done, so who they need to send. So they created this natural language processing model. They trained this model in uh, Google Cloud with uh, Cloud ML. Um, once it's there, you can also, through the API, uh, make predictions. So when the data comes in, what the first thing they would do is take that speech and use our speech as text API and actually translate that to text. And then they would use that text and send it to their natural language processing model to actually look what's the request of that text. And then they would send a result. So here's a way where we can see where they've really focused on the problem that they were trying to deal with, a very specific domain, and taking their domain knowledge to actually um, create that model. But for the, common, the more common task of taking speech to text in different languages, they used our speech to text API. Uh, you need to go that one more. Oh, just click on your icon there at the bottom. There you go. This is when we hope the Wi-Fi hasn't been consumed. So <laughs> am I going to speak into this? Probably because I have the microphone on. So my boiler is broken, boiler being a radiator in England. My boiler is broken. It's processing the request. OK, we're sending a heating engineer. Well, that's quite a reasonable thing to do. Um, I need someone to adjust my chair, because I'm too lazy. Well, I'm not too lazy to do it myself, but every time I try and adjust a chair, it's never right. <laughs> OK, the person responsible for chairs has been notified. So basically, they wanted to create a way to facilitate these kind of requests coming in for a building. Um, I think this is quite a novel example. <clears throat> I want to point out, because a lot of this stuff is, is kind of hard to get grips on, we created a, a website. It's called. Uh, if you Google TensorFlow Playground, I think it's playgroundtensorflow.org, you can find this website. I think I, it on, I wrote it on the screen. <laughs> if you go there, you can actually uh, cr like create a neural network and look at uh, like common problems of pattern, change the functions, and see actually what's happening at all the steps. So I encourage you, if you're interested in neural networks and you want to have a look at how they work under the hood, this is a good place to go. And, um, before I show this video, which is actually the end of the talk, I'm going to just tell you a, a, a little story. In 2009, uh, we, we have a, as you may well know, at Google, we like to make April Fool's jokes. So every year, we do our best. It's a bit of a competition internally to come up with the best April Fool's joke. Uh, in 2009, someone created an April Fool's joke saying that Gmail will automatically answer your mails for you. Um, it was an April Fool's joke. Everyone believed it, and we got into lots of trouble. In 2015, we actually deployed this on our inbox. 
So we actually created a, a natural language processing model, which would uh, process an email to see how can I reply to this. And this isn't about responding to all your personal mails or responding to all your business mails. This is about responding to those simple requests like, um, can you make dinner this evening? Sure, great, I'll be there. Or um, can you uh, pick up the kids tonight? Yeah, fine, I'll, I'll do that. You know, so those kind of things that you just really want to type a few words just to reply, to acknowledge. And you know, normally it would cost you some time typing them, and you know, especially if you're kind of walking with your mobile phone, it's a bit awkward. So you have a little button there just with replies that kind of learn from the, 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 the kind of replies and mails that you're receiving. So it accounts, actually on mobile telephones that are using Android and Inbox, it accounts for 10% of all the replies. So that's a good example of making something useful and automatic, really understanding the problem you're trying to solve. And it started way back with a joke. And this year in Holland, um, we, we, we brought out a, a new feature using machine learning. It's called Google Wind. Because as, as you know, and as people have been telling me since I've been here and been complaining all the time that the heating's at 24 degrees and I feel like I'm going to faint, because at home we have it at like 18 degrees Celsius. Uh, they're saying, yeah, well, Holland has such bad weather. So this year, we really wanted to come up with a way of tackling that problem, because we want to solve difficult problems, of course. So I'm going to show you a video how we actually approach that. And then I'll let you go to lunch. The Netherlands is one of the best countries in the world to live in. It has a strong economy, and some of the world's best DJs were born here. There's only one downside. It rains 145 days a year. It's a lot. At Google, we solved this problem by repurposing Holland's old windmills, using them not to capture wind, but to generate it. To pull this off, we needed to build a better understanding of the weather. We used Google Cloud Platform to predict how clouds will behave. We then connected all 1,170 windmills in Holland to prevent bad weather from happening. Let's take it for a spin. Machine learning enables all the mills to collaborate. Of course, we need some rain now and then. With Google Wind, we can also decide when and where it rains. So Google Wind is able to keep clear skies any season. Mensen, zon, zon, en nog geen zon, net als de rest van het jaar. I'm proud to announce that from April 1st, we're able to guarantee clear skies for everyone. <clears throat> so we can but hope. <laughs> Let's, um, let's see what, what you guys can come up with, with your own models, and I hope um, what you've seen today at least inspires you to start looking at some of this technology and how it can work for you. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we're all out of time, so if you do have questions for Robert, he's around for the rest of the day. You know what he looks like now, so go and grab him and ask him.